eight. Okay, uh, tonight I'm happy to welcome Maria Van Vallis, who is an interdisciplinary educator in Ontario and a facilitator and writer, writer with the Critical Thinking Consortium. For the last 10 years, she has taught in the junior, intermediate, and senior levels, primarily within PDSB. Maria has an extensive experience in inquiry and project-based learning with a focus on integrating critical thinking strategies in the teaching of literacy, numeracy, social sciences, and the arts. She has qualifications in multiple subject areas across the grade levels. Maria has mentored teachers, written curriculum documents, overseen the development of the online learning platform, and collaborated in school teams to implement effective dynamic pedagogy designed to engage learners and prepare them to meet the challenges of the 21st century. It's wonderful that so many of us here from across the province to hear Maria's amazing presentation. I can guarantee that it's jam-packed of information and uh, lots of points for discussion. So Maria, are you ready to take over? I am. Thank you so much, Mally. And welcome to everyone. I uh, just want to thank you for taking some of your precious time in the evening uh, to be here for this session. And I'm I'm really looking forward to the next hour and a half where we're going to learn together. I did want to ask really quickly using the polling tool um, if any of you have had sessions with the Critical Thinking Consortium previously. So if you just want to indicate that. Okay, so a pretty even split. So I do want to um, really in this session, the, the focus is on student thinking and nurturing the critical thinking in mathematics. And we're going to look at a spectrum from ways that we can tweak our questions to ways of maybe even reorienting our classroom. So there'll be a, hopefully a, a real spectrum for people to be able to engage with some of these ideas. I did want to let people know um, just up front that they can reach me at any point um, after the session. If you have questions, you can also follow me on Twitter, and I'm happy to engage with people via that medium. And, and also, you can learn more about the Critical Thinking Consortium at our website, tc2.ca. I want to ask people about what one of the most memorable moments you have experienced in teaching mathematics. And I recognize that there may be some of you who are perhaps not teaching at the moment. Um, but if you could think about, if, if this question doesn't resonate, then one of the most memorable experiences in learning mathematics. And I'm going to bring up a slide here and invite people to write directly on the slide so that we can see each other's answers to this question. So take a moment and, and think about it one of the most memorable moments you've experienced. So for those of you who aren't familiar um, with the text tool, you can go over to the whiteboard tool. And the text tool is the fourth one down. So you just click that and then double click on the blue space. I'm just really struck by the answers um, that that you are sharing, and I want to thank you so much for for these these answers. Um, you know, some of the things that that we're finding memorable, of course, are when we have students who haven't liked the subject of math, and we know there's so many reasons why our students feel tremendous anxiety in mathematics, and so our work is so important in helping promote that kind of growth mindset and the belief um, that they can absolutely do it, that there isn't a math gene as um, someone's writing. And I know we've had 
parents, I'm sure a number of you have, um, will say, well, they get it. They come by this inability to do math for me because I've never liked math. And, and we, have a, we have a bit of an uphill battle at times in trying to counter that. Um, and I also notice people discussing the, the, what's memorable is those instances where a portal of understanding opens for our students, where something complex now becomes attainable and understandable to them. And it, it is really magical and it is so exciting um, when we're able to do that, particularly with those concepts that we know um, through our years of teaching can provide some real difficulty for our students. And of course, the joy and fun when when math is is fun and engaging, and when thinking becomes something that students delight in doing. So I'll just give people just another um, moment to finish up with their responses. <laughs> I love that students actually run to math class. <laughs> you are definitely uh, engaging your students, whoever that was who wrote that. Students sharing strategies with each other, being able to communicate, that's another really delightful and joyful thing to experience in our classrooms when they can communicate those understandings. So thank you, everyone. I am going to um, move on to the slides. So I don't want to interrupt. Um, just give people just another moment if they want to <coughs> read some of the other answers, and then we'll, we'll move ahead. And if you're not able to use a text tool, please feel free to mention it in the, in the chat. And I'll try to keep my eye on that. And hopefully, um, Mally can also <laughs> make sure that I, if, I've, if I've missed something, to feel free to point that out to me. OK, so Sajah, I'm sorry. You're having some trouble seeing um, what's recorded. Usually, there are, um, th there are little um, bars where you can link down if someone has written a, a great deal. So I'm not sure if that's the, the problem, if you're able to access that. And sometimes it is um, just your, your operating system could be an issue. So I'll definitely keep that in mind. OK, so uh, I'm going to move, move ahead at this point. John Vandewal um, said something that I that has really really struck me. This is something that I've really taken to heart as a teacher um, because at times uh, someone once described teaching as being at a children's birthday party with no balloons and no cake and no clowns. You're it, <laughs> and you are desperately trying to you know engage students. But I, it also made me wonder about how much of the work. Uh, we are doing as teachers and that ultimately the one who is doing the work is the one who's doing the learning. And how do we reorient our classrooms to ensure that it is our students who are doing the thinking and grasping the concepts, that that won't come even from a really fantastic explanation, that at times that isn't enough, that it really has to come through thinking through and problem solving. And when we're looking at and talking about engagement, um, this is a taxonomy of engagement that can be really helpful uh, as we think about our own mathematics classroom. The difference between students who are compliant and on task and doing the work or somewhat interested and entertained. Um, but how do we orient our instructional strategies and our pedagogy and the tasks we design so that we are providing opportunities for students to be truly challenged and caught up. You know, it's that moment when, you know, you could be doing a Sudoku and you, you, you don't want to stop because you are, you are so caught up in it and you just can't put it down. Or when we see that in our students, so when someone's describing students running to their math class, um, they're clearly challenged and caught up and perhaps transformed and empowered by, it is, by what it is that's happening. So how do we design our task to really invite true intellectual engagement. And uh, this, 
I find this graph also really helpful when we think about engagement and student success. And we notice that when our students don't have the skills to access a challenge or and they're not being challenged, they're likely to feel very apathetic and disinterested in learning. When our students have a high degree of skill but are not being challenged, they're likely to find the work quite boring and meaningless. When, our, when we challenge our students but aren't explicitly teaching them the tools to engage in those challenges, our students are likely to feel quite anxious and nervous and apprehensive about, about learning. And so that, that orange zone is really the sweet spot. How do we both appropriately challenge students and also ensure that they have the tools and the skills to enter into challenges and be successful? And, and I'm hoping that some of the strategies that we'll look at tonight will perhaps provide some ideas about that and how we can enter into that orange zone. I want to invite people, if you've got a piece of paper beside you or if on your computer you want to open up a document, um, but I'd like to create a thought space during the course of this session. And you can choose one of these questions. Um, it could be one that most resonates for you at this moment or if you want to try to tackle both. Um, but these are some two questions that might guide our inquiry. And I want to invite you to just write down and jot down some initial thoughts that you have in response to one of these questions. Um, because I know that you're already thinking about how to effectively design tasks to facilitate deeper thinking in students. Or you're thinking about how to intentionally use critical thinking to foster those strong mathematical reasoning skills. So I want to invite people to just take a moment and jot down some ideas to create that think space during this session. Okay. So again, just wanting to create the graphic too of a, a different thought space. And I want to return to the idea of a thought space or a thought book a little bit later and talk about it as a as a as a really powerful tool that we can use in our classroom, in our mathematics classroom. I'd like to ask um, you to look at these two quotes. And in the chat box, um, you can post some of your comments. How similar are these two statements? So how similar do you think these statements are? Is there anything different about them? Do you find them very similar? Do, do you think they both make a case for teaching mathematics? So Lisa said they both discussed how math skills or lack thereof can be empowering or disempowering. Numeracy is not just numbers. Very similar. Both give relevance to mathematics as a life skill. Both making a case for critical thinking. Thank you for these really thoughtful comments. Also, too, just for us to have a moment as, as mathematics teachers, to recognize how foundational numerate, truly numerate students, critically thoughtful students, um, and, and that connection between critical thinking and numeracy is such an important dimension 
of our democracy and of our of our society. Sharon says the first statement is a bit isolating, that those who don't have a grasp of numbers cannot participate. The power to think in question. One has more negative connotations, the other more positive. More positive, some people think that the second one is more positive and embraces more people. First one being more of a deficit model. Well, thank you again for these really thoughtful comments. Um, what I'd like us to think about is that what we just engaged with, even that that simple task of looking at these two quotes and asking how similar they are, was an example of critical thinking, of a, of a question that's framed that invites critical thinking. And um, the consortium, which is um, really over the last over 20 years, is teachers and researchers and academics and principals and superintendents who come together to really grapple with this idea of what is thinking and how do we teach quality thinking. And so we define critical thinking as thinking through a problematic situation about what to believe or how to act where the thinker makes a reasoned judgment that reflects a competent use of the intellectual tools for quality thinking. So even in the way I frame that question of how similar, um, there, wasn't there wasn't a right answer to that question. Um, people provided different ideas about whether they were similar or how similar they were. But you did, you did support your answers with, with reason judgment. And you were also using intellectual tools. And it's making some of the intellectual tools that we're using when we're thinking that is so powerful. How do we make the tools of thought explicit so that we can both teach them more effectively and so that our students can use them independently. The person is thinking critically if he or she is judging or making choices among options in light of criteria. And that criteria, we're going to explore that through this session, um, this criteria that we use to frame questions forms a situation where our students have to make a reasoned judgment. We are inviting quality thinking. We we'll want to really look at what that means. So when we are promoting a thinking classroom, and here we're talking about our mathematics classroom, and we want to promote thinking, um, mathematical thinking rich, critical quality thinking. We're looking to shape the climate to support thinking, create opportunities through the tasks and questions that we design and that we present to students, that we are building capacity to think by, again, these five intellectual tools are listed along the bottom. The background knowledge that one needs to engage and enter into a challenge, criteria for judgment, thinking vocabulary, so that could be things like the specific mathematical vocabulary like evidence, proof, justify. These words can be stumbling blocks for our students when they don't um, have a recognition of what the word means. And they can really limit our students entering into deeper thinking. Thinking strategies, and there's so many of the strategies we use and try to teach explicitly in mathematics. And the habits of mind, and this is, this is also very important. Um, do we notice that our students have some difficulty taking risks? Do we notice that our students have, are not always paying attention to detail, important details? How do we nurture these, these habits of mind of quality thinking? So I want to ask you to take a look at this cartoon. I, I am a big Calvin and Hobbes fan. I'll put that out there. Um, and if, if Calvin were a student in your classroom, what might he need based on your observation here? What might Calvin need? And you can just um, write your answer in the chat box. OK. 
Okay, so basic number sense, yes. <laughs> Another research strategy than asking a peer. Um, so the question is, if you were observing Calvin in your class, you're observing this moment, um, aside from the fact that he's asking this could be a testing situation, but what might Calvin need? What might he need based on what you're seeing here? Manipulative to help solve the question. A way to determine reasonableness. A better question. <laughs> These are great answers, everybody. Great answers. Yes, what's reasonable? Strategy to start. Confidence. There's so much that we learn and we know this about our students by, by observing them. Um, if, if we had a test and, and, you know, we had a series of questions, let's just take it the very simple, like 12 plus 7 for this example. When we're marking that test, and, and those are the kinds of answers, like the answer would be 19, we don't know a whole lot about that student. We know that perhaps they got the answer right. They might have had a lucky guess. Um, so how are, that's another question, is how are we going to, how do we observe and assess and provide that guidance? And that will be a feature of the next webinar, but I did still want to introduce that question because I know it's, it's a key. As we're looking at reframing and reorienting the questions and tasks we give students, <clears throat> we're also looking for ways to assess their thinking. So we are trying to support classrooms where students are learning to think and thinking to learn. When we're thinking critically in math, if we're thinking critically in mathematics, we are thinking like a mathematician. And I think that's, that's a really important idea, that thinking critically in math is what mathematicians do. They think critically. They make reasoned judgments in light of various criteria. They make use of their background knowledge. They use thinking strategies. And they bring habits of mind to what it is that we're doing. So how might we bump up the critical thinking in any math task? So I'd like you to take a look at these three types of questions. And in the chat box, um, I would like you to tell the difference or speak to the difference between the type 1, type 2, and type 3 questions. And I'm going to get caught up on some of the great comments that you've been making in the chat box. And also, I'd want to invite, if anybody wants to speak to these, and I'd love to hear some other um, voices, just raise your hand and feel free to speak about what you think the, the difference is. Yes, Saja, please go ahead. Just press the talk button and, uh, and go ahead. Um, I noticed that Type 2 questions seem to be very metacognitive and reflective in nature. So getting students to think about the type of learner that they are, the type of math thinking that they are comfortable with. Um, type 3 questions to me appear very open and would allow students to choose numbers or situations that they're most comfortable with. Um, and access, would allow them to access their thinking or the mathematics more easily. Um, and then type 1 questions are a little more close, but um, a little close, but they are, um, but they still allow the student to explore, just not and as why the nature. Thank you so much. Would other people like to speak to the differences and what they notice about these questions and the differences between them? I 
So I'm just going to read a few of the comments. Um, so type 2 allows students to reflect on their thinking. Type 1 allows for a beginning look at the concepts. Type 2 asks you to think about process. Type 3, open-ended, invite more critical thinking and ask for their reasoning. So, you know, when we look at the type 1, and again, I just want to be very clear that uh, these categories, in, in these categorizations, um, it's not to say that type 1 are bad or type 2 are bad questions. Um, we're just looking at the differences and so that we can explore some of the ways we frame questions. Um, so with type 1, there is a definite right answer um, to all of the questions in that column. And so it is a matter of knowing or being able to find the answer. And with type 2, there really is no wrong answer to the type 2. They're, they're more personal preference. And, you know, in that reflection, <coughs> the personal reflection, um, that you, you can't be right or wrong. It's, it's students going to say what they prefer. With the type 3, they are more open-ended. Um, they definitely require some justification uh, to support the thinking or the, the conclusion that a student would come to in response to that question. Uh, perhaps invite more um, some curiosity and inquiry in order to answer it. They're not going to find the answer to any of those type 3 questions in a book or even at the hands of a calculator necessarily. They're going to have to think through them. So, you know, these, these type, again, type 1 and type 2 are questions we're going to ask in our classroom, but most people in the chat box observe that the type 3 really do invite more of the deeper um, quality or critical thinking. So how might we frame our questions more effectively so that we invite that? What, what does that look like? And we're starting to get a, a bit of a sense of that. Um, so again, I'll just ask people to just take a moment and consolidate. And I also want to invite you that, again, with that thought space that I asked you to, to start, if you're looking at those questions, and I will bring them back up. Um, but if you want to add to any of the, any of your thinking about either the critical thinking in, in mathematics or um, helping students to develop their reasoning skills. So how do we translate this understanding into setting up critical challenges, both large and small? And I talk about that. I talk about the spectrum of ways that we can invite critical thinking in the consolidation phase and some of the ways we frame questions. But also, I want to provide some examples for what a larger inquiry might look like in mathematics. So we, at the consortium, um, there is, there's been a lot of work around how you really effectively frame a critical thinking question. And there have been six key prompts that uh, many believe are an exhaustive list, that these are, you know, these are six ways that when you want to invite critical thinking, here are the ways that you can do it. So I want to lead us through some exercises just to build our own capacity um, in these six different prompts, these six different frames. I like to think of it as six ways to frame an effective question. So the first way is critique the piece. So I want to invite you to look at the definition, which is on the right, and then there's three examples, and one of them is not an example of critique the piece. So I want to invite you to identify which one, in light of the definition, is not a critique the piece, and, and also to consider tweaking it and writing that in a chat box. Um, so that it is a critique the piece. So again, looking at the definition on the right, looking at the three examples, one of them is not a critique the piece. Identify that and tweak it so that it does become an example of a critique the piece frame. Or, and if somebody wants to actually 
jump in, just raise your hand and feel free to speak to this. I invite you to do so. So Jane said that uh, question three does not belong. And I'll invite you as well if you want to provide <coughs> some reasoning as to why, um, or again, a tweak, please feel free to do so. Yeah, it's definitely a little challenging sometimes to think about the tweak, especially when this is the first, for some people, the first time thinking of the question frames in this way. Yeah, and we, there's, there, you're conducting a survey to gather useful data, but you're not, perhaps if we ask students to consider whether the data they've collected is useful, that becomes a critique of the piece. Is the data you collected through your survey useful? And so our criteria there is useful, and we're inviting students to consider the usefulness of that data. We're asking them to make a decision about it. I apologize for some of my coughing. I've got a little bit of the remnants of the the, of the winter um, cold and, and bronchitis. Okay, so are we ready to move on to um, the second prompt? People just want to give me a, a yes or a no. I just want to make sure I, I'm not rushing. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, the next prompt is judging the better or best. So here we're judging from two or more options which meets the criteria. So again, we've got an example that doesn't belong in these three. Okay, and Maria, you've identified number one. It doesn't have two or more options. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, and again, if we were to tweak it, we could invite students to determine which of the three patterns, or four patterns, or two patterns, is more concise, is the more concise and accurate way. And one thing I want to say is it's important here, though, that when we do set up options for students to consider. Um, we don't want to set up a situation where there is a right answer and we're, we give them a, you know, there's a right answer and a clear wrong answer because that is not an invitation to think critically. So we do want to give them some options that require that differentiation and, and deeper thought and some justification. Okay, so we'll move on to the third. Reworking the piece. So again, we're transforming a product or performance in light of additional information. Yeah, so number two um, is not a rework. It's also um, one of the things I want to say here that so often our students are, uh, you know, given when we present uh, an example to students, it's so often that we present them with the ideal or um, the most effective solution, but it can also be very interesting to help them conceptually get at the 
criteria, let's say of an effective solution, by asking them to take an effective solution and, and make it an ineffective solution, right? Even that, sometimes inverting, um, inverting something so that it becomes what you don't want to see. Like, for example, uh, write a boring uh, paragraph. Sometimes these are little creative ways of helping students to actually gain a sense of some of the qualities of the more effective or ideal model that we want to see. So reworking the piece can sometimes allow for that. Um, or providing different scenario like what would, if we were to conduct this experiment on Mars, what would have to change? Right? How would this experiment have to change in order if we were to conduct it on Mars? So that's a very advanced science question, but it can give you just some possibility of the creativity that can come through this prompt. Moving on to our fourth example, decode the puzzle. So we're suggesting and justifying a proposed solution, explanation, or interpretation to a confusing or enigmatic situation. So any thoughts about which one is not an example of a decode? Okay, so if I'm saying number two. Yeah, and, and some reasons for that, if people want to share their reasons as to why. So okay, kid is saying for two, you could try how do the pattern blocks show the story pattern, or perhaps use the pattern blocks to uh, represent the pattern. But in number two, currently, they've discovered the pattern, so there's no enigmatic situation there for them to solve. So that's what we want with the decode, is we've given them something where they need to try to justify what the cause or reasons behind something that's confusing or enigmatic is. The fifth is the design to specifications. So develop a product that meets a given set of criteria or conditions. Right, and Mitzi said three doesn't require a product to be designed. Yeah, so we could tweak that and say design a non-standard unit that would be suitable for measuring a desk. So with a simple tweak. Great, yes. Okay, and the final is perform to specifications. So performing or undertaking a course of action that meets a given set of criteria or conditions. So again, we've got one here that's a non-example. This one is definitely, uh, could be considered just a little more 
uh, settle. So three, because you're creating rather than performing. Yes. And some other people have mentioned that um, the subtracting 24 from 53 is, is not necessarily the kind of um, criteria that invites the, the deeper thinking, that it's, that, you know, it's already been said and there's not a qualitative dimension to the thinking around that. So that's, that has also been mentioned, but there's, there's some debate about that. But absolutely, performing is really something that happens. The way I like to think about it is it's something that's happening in, in real time. So I'd like to take a moment, uh, again, for you to revisit your thought space. And I do want to also invite you, if you'd like to share for some people to speak, I'd love, we, we learn so much from each other and I know that, um, you know, there are such talented educators who are part of this webinar. So um, if you want to share some of your thinking about one or both of these questions, I want to take the opportunity now to invite you to do that. If you want to take a moment to think first, uh, feel free to do so. At this point, too, if there are any questions um, that people have or something specific that you would like to see addressed. Can everyone still hear me? I just want to make sure. You sound good, Maria. Okay, great. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Um, so again, any, would anyone like to share some of their, their thoughts to one of, one of these questions? I, I would love for you to return to your point about how you felt thinking critically is thinking like a mathematician because um, the, the title of this uh, webinar was Think Like a Mathematician and You've made a distinct connection there, and I wonder if you could talk about that a bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when our students are engaged in rich mathematic tasks, they're having to make a lot of real decisions. So when we think about some of those question prompts, like, designing an effective solution. These are the kinds of questions and tasks that, that math, mathematical thinking is concerned with. Um, I don't know if any of you have read the, the book, The Mathematician's Lament. Um, I believe it's by, I believe it's by Keith Devlin, but I could have that incorrect. But in this book, he talks about how you know, if we were to teach music where all the students did was practice the scales over and over and over again and never got to engage in a rich symphony or muck about with creating the music themselves, um, we would be appalled, you know, if, if that's what music was. And in certain ways, uh, some of the ways that mathematics has been traditionally taught has focused very much on um, 
some rote elements and made that the focus. And so that students aren't actually engaged in making reasoned judgments, making decisions, having to consider different perspectives, different strategies, different solutions, justifying their thinking and their proofs, communicating effectively why they made some of the choices that they did, Fra even framing some questions and concepts in new ways. And that's the kind of thinking that mathematicians are engaged with. And it really is critical thought. It's, it's that reason judgment. And so it's that shift that, you know, has been underway for some time of recognizing the, the quality mathematical thinking. Yes, Paul Lockhart, thank you. Yes, I knew, I knew I had it wrong. Um, the mathematical thinking is not the result of just a series of memorized answers. And, and it's not to say that there isn't a place for having that number sense and being able to draw upon facts quickly. That's, that's a bit of a false debate. But I also think we probably see our students, and, and I've had students who say have done some of the programs that reinforce um, knowing the facts off the top of their head, which can be useful, but aren't able to engage in the deeper problem solving. And that is a worry, right, when our students aren't able to reason through and independently use strategies. And so those intellectual tools are the tools that a mathematician is going to use and bring to bear in a complex situation. Um, I don't know that website. Thank you for posting that. Would you rather math? Uh, thank you for that. And also there's a, um, you know, there's also some great websites like looking at mistakes, like my favorite no. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that website, which is, which is also so wonderful for how we, you know, really b that recognizing and helping our students see that mistakes aren't, not only are they something to be tolerated, but they're something to be celebrated because it is by making errors and having the opportunity to truly reflect and understand where our thinking um, may have been inaccurate, having that opportunity literally forms new synapses in our brain. So I tell my students that mistakes actually make you smarter <laughs> so long as you are able to recognize and have a chance to reflect on them. They actually make you smarter. And so I've really worked hard to try to make mistakes part of the curriculum in the classroom, not something that is to be feared, and really try to push that anxiety that so many students feel out of the class by letting mistakes and the mucking about be really a, just a part of the whole experience, which again, um, you know, mathematicians really celebrate. Like they spend years and decades on proofs and, you know, to know to, sometimes they're not successful and they have to, you know, that is a tremendous habit of mind. Um, and, and I recognize that not all of our students are going to go on to be mathematicians, but the mathematical thinking is still something to be, to be cultivated. Would anyone else like to share any of their thoughts to, to these questions? Or again, if you have a question you'd like me to answer at this point. Okay, so we'll, we'll just uh, proceed. So these are <coughs> the four attributes of a critical thinking question and task. So again, as we're thinking about what we're designing in our classrooms, this can be really helpful helpful uh, guide for us to ensure that we are providing these opportunities for our students to think like a mathematician. I just want to share it with in the chat box. Um, you mentioned that you had a high school friend that you tutored, and she said by the time she got the right answer, she really understood why the others were wrong. And that's absolutely it. 
our mistakes are critical. They are, I think, the foundation um, of, of learning, really, and especially in this subject. And I think the fear of, and that sometimes the, the time pressure that math has often been taught in, you know, like you've got to get the answer right in the first one and the sense of speed has done a real disservice to the quality, slow thinking um, that, that really so many mathematicians engage with. Uh, Joe Bowler talks about Laurent Schwartz, uh, who is a gifted mathematician, won the Fields Prize. And he said that in school he felt stupid in math because he was so slow. He was a slow and deliberate thinker. And, um, you know, but math was, when, when he talked about in his experience, it was always like, who's got the answer first and getting it right and having it right. And, um, and I, again, I really think we're, we're shifting and really looking at that and, and redesigning our classrooms to better meet the needs of our students. The more, too, we understand the brain, um, I think it really supports what's going on in our classrooms. So I just want to say something about number four. Um, so sometimes uh, if, I, if I am giving, a, I don't always give tests, but if I am giving a test, um, and sometimes I will use a multiple choice that still requires a student to think through a question, but I will say provide two strong pieces of mathematical evidence to support your thinking. And we've unpacked that idea of evidence. Um, yeah, Saja, absolutely. And I'm so glad for it that there is a shift that's encouraging us to slow down. And even this invitation to have a thought space and for us to explore this question through this presentation, um, you know, it's just, just a small invitation and tweak so that the learning that we're doing is something that we, we carry on. We're not just sometimes getting some quick ideas and then going into it, but having our own inquiry in our own classroom. And I've been doing that more and more of just asking a question and focusing on one or two elements of my program and, and trying to see what happens, um, you know, observing and, and inquiring myself into student learning and my teaching. So here's some simple frames. Um, that, again, are little tweaks that support this deepening of mathematical thinking, right? Is this an effective strategy? Is this an effective solution? And unpacking what effective is, and we're going to do that um, in, in a few moments. Which of these two strategies is more effective? What would happen if we introduce negative integers into this equation? For example, how does this solution work? How does this strategy work? What are the merits of this strategy? How would you figure out how to do, solve this problem and actually getting, be, allowing strategies to become explicit? Just want to get what's in the chat box here. Um, we asked our class the other day who got a better deal. One person bought a pizza slice for $1.50, and the other um, sorry, I'm having trouble. And the other paid I, I keep missing that part, but how many factors they identified before being willing to answer size of the slice? Was it the same story? Did they have the same topping? <laughs> yeah. So the freshness, I was thrilled with their thinking. Yes, I'm considering so many variables. Um, an another three prompts from Alan Schoenfeld uh, that can be useful. So just, <coughs> this can be quite simple, and you could ask these prompts going around if students are grappling with a problem. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? And how is it helping you? Um, and that, these, Simple questions can actually introduce some metacognitive awareness, again, reflecting on their thinking. You know, and we think, we know there's, you know, there's students we have who get, who get stuck in, and almost into a bit of a corner in their own minds and sometimes asking, okay, so what are you doing? And giving them that opportunity to explain and then why are you doing it? And 
it's quite powerful sometimes seeing them shift. Oh, well, I was thinking, you know, that, you know, well, I was thinking about this in relation to fractions that I had to um, find a common denominator, but it's but, but something's not working and I'm multiplying. And they, they begin to sometimes be able to understand that their strategy is not working, but they need that awareness. Like, how is it helping you? And imagine if our students internalized this and they were asking themselves these questions as they're solving a problem. What am I doing? Why am I doing it? And is it helping? Because we've also seen students who keep doing the same thing and they're not getting anywhere and they're sort of frustrated. And so even for them to recognize, I need a different strategy here. I need a clarification question. Yes, the slide was, was was also for teachers, Jan, to say, and you know, with their students and and pack that together. Here's two really powerful, simple prompts. Um, does this answer, or does this solution, or does this strategy make sense? Um, when we think about our our Calvin and Hobbes question or comic, um, you know, imagine if Calvin had that that sense of reasonableness that people were referring to. Just does, does your answer make sense? One of the things I've noticed is as I've introduced this prompt, there's a couple of things that I'm really pleased about, have, I've, I've noticed have begun to happen more and more. Um, I'm getting less, when I'm looking at student work and evaluating it and assessing it, I'm noticing that my students are much more aware of reasonableness than they have been before. So this, this is very simple, but very, very powerful. Because we, you know, we, we, we ask these questions and then there's no, you know, there's no way the answer could be less than um, or could be more than 20. Like when you look at the question and, and our students have got like a thousand and you're like, oh, if only they were starting to think in a reasonable way, as a mathematician could could really identify, well, clearly that's wrong and I'm on the wrong track. And I've noticed my students more and more saying that, like, oh, wait a minute, I know this must be incorrect because it can't be that in relation to what this situation is. And even deciding, um, another strategy I used is I, in, in a grade eight algebra unit, I gave students five solutions to a complex algebra problem. And what I used to do is give them the complex algebra problem and then what I noticed is the students who, you know, were strong math students were able to enter into that challenge. Um, you know, students who needed more support, could, some of them got it, some of them didn't, and then I had my students who were struggling. Um, what I what I noticed when I introduced, what I did instead of giving them the question, I gave it to them, had them create some initial thoughts but said you don't need to solve it, gave them five strategies. We unpack the criteria for an effective math solution and they made the determination and they rank ordered those solutions according to their effectiveness. And it was a very powerful, it was very powerful learning for them to do that because they, it, and it was a, it was the kind of assignment that all students could enter into because the solution was there, they had the criteria, so they were now having to make these judgments and decisions that wasn't always about just them being able to solve a problem. They were assessing a solution and through that, learning more about different strategies. I feel like I've missed someone's question, so I just want to go back for a moment here. Um, yeah, reasonableness and estimates. I'm sorry, I feel like someone had a question and I'm not able to, to get at it, so please feel free to type it in. I think it was about the first, the first question, um, so please feel free and I apologize. So how else might we integrate critical thinking prompts into some of the beautiful open-ended questions? And I know some of you have been providing examples of that. So let's say we give this open-ended question. Um, Priya multiplied three numbers and got a product of 60. What might the three numbers have been? And I encourage you to just, just do the question. I mean, sometimes it's fun for us too to just do the math. Um, 
you know, I'm sure a, a number of you are going to be able to do this very easily. Um, so just on your own, a little piece of paper you have, what might the three numbers have been that resulted in a product of 60? And, and I know more and more of us are using these open-ended questions again because they've got an entry point for all students, right? It, it's, they can, um, most of our students can enter into these questions, but where they can go, we can really take them um, to some exciting places in terms of the mathematical concepts we'll study. Yeah, absolutely, Ainsley. That's what I love about these open-ended questions as well. Okay, so let's say, um, I want you to think about what your strategy was, and probably many of you have the basic number sense that you were able to do it pretty much off the top of your head. Yeah. So let's say we ask this of our students. I'm going to put two different um, strategies up. Okay, I'd like you to just take a look at the communication of these two strategies that our students might give in response to this question. So we've got these open-ended questions. We've got the communication of, of some strategies and solutions. And now we can bring some of the critical thinking questions into the consolidation phase. So that's another possibility. We don't always have to design every question we give students to be a critical thinking prompt. Um, but if we do an open-ended question, we can now invite in the consolidation, in the unpacking, in the examining of a solution, some critical thinking questions that, again, can deepen the thinking and support the conceptual understanding. So again, going back to these, these critical challenges, right, the six different prompts, let's say we chose um, which one is more effective. We did a we we chose a judge the better or best for our consolidation question. We could we can choose any one of these, um, but let's say we chose that one. Choose between the two strategies because they're you know they're both they're both good strategies. So how are we going to decide now which one is most effective? Um, and again, in consolidation, we can when we're checking if if in this moment when our students have given their solution, often we'll say to them, is your answer correct? But a little tweak that can invite deeper thinking is, how do you know that your answer is reasonable? What evidence, inference, or clues, and we've got to make sure our students understand what that language is, allow you to provide the answer with some certainty, right? And really, there is an investment to unpack this language with students, but it really does pay off in the quality of thinking and the quality of solutions that you start to see uh, become accessible to more and more of the students in your class, not just the ones who, you know, ha are innately um, strong thinkers in a particular area. So if we go back and we ask them which strategy is most effective between these two, we are going to have to unpack the criteria of effectiveness. So what is the criteria for most effective? So I want you to think about that. Right? What, it, what would be some criteria? And you, you can write it on the screen, or since that was causing some problems, again, feel free to put that in the chat box. What would be some possible criteria for an effective strategy? Uses background knowledge to understand context. Um, it didn't ask for multiple solutions. It just, well, it just said to provide 
how, what, what, well, it did say, um, what are some possible <clears throat> numbers that, that she might have used. So it was open-ended, Jan. There wasn't uh, one particular answer. So what, again, might be some criteria for effective in this context? Does not rely on memorizing. Easy to follow. Using patterning, using math vocabulary. Okay, so these are all great examples. Um, and again, you, you may, with your students, come up with a list. I always say, um, I, I strongly recommend not ever unpacking to more than five evaluative qualities because it just becomes overwhelming. I generally try to keep it to about three or four. Um, I find that helpful. So I'm going to give you some possibilities here, but again, the answers that you've given um, are absolutely valid. So we might say that an effective strategy is efficient, it's well understood, and it's reasonable and accurate. So this could be some of the criteria we say that this, these are the qualities of an effective strategy. <clears throat> so efficient, it incorporates previous math knowledge to arrive at a solution more quickly. Uh, I understand what they're doing. And the solution makes sense and leads to a correct answer. So again, we, wanna, we need to work with our students so they understand even what these, what these elements of effective mean. Yeah, kids will tell you speed, Jan, and, and I would, uh, you know, again, sometimes that could be it. Like there's a context where being able to come to an answer more quickly, um, like let's say in algebra, the difference between being able to represent a situation algebraically versus doing a whole table of values until you get to the, you know, nth term or hundredth term, you know, absolutely there's a place for that. So I also want to look at, so we, we've looked at framing different questions, we've looked at how we might incorporate critical thinking into consolidation. I also want to provide um, some examples of what critical inquiry might look like if it infused an entire unit. Um, before I do that, there's one other thing I wanted to say about, about using criteria. I want to share with you um, something I did this year where I was getting my students used to evaluating their own work in light of criteria. And I'd given them a problem, this was early in the year, and I wanted them to hand in their solution. And I'd given them the criteria. And what I anticipated, sort of my conjecture was that a lot of the students weren't going to pay that much attention to the criteria. They're going to solve the problem the way, you know, whatever habits they've, they've got to that point around solving a problem or getting it done. Um, so what I did in the class where they were to hand it in is I said, okay, I have put the criteria up on the board, wanted to make sure everyone understood it, and I said, before you hand in your solution, I would like you to look over your solution and, and ensure that it meets this criteria for an effective solution. And some really wonderful things began to happen. Here's what I noticed in that moment. Um, a couple of students came to me and said, oh, I just realized that my answer is incorrect. Can I please, can I please um, resubmit this? And, and at that point, because I was really focused on thinking and not just getting it done, I said, absolutely. And another student said, you know what, I really just rushed this and I was just trying to get it done and it hasn't done these things. Can I please redo this? I said, absolutely. And as the years gone on, they've internalized that criteria, and they're using it to assess their own work. So that's the power of it as well, is it, it's the students who now are doing that assessment of their work, and it's taking some of the burden off of me as the teacher and always having to be the one saying whether something's right or wrong or, or good, and I'm really working to give that over to students and empower them with the tools to determine reasonableness in their answers, to determine effectiveness of their solutions. 
So um, we know that one of the frames we're using in, in mathematics is the processes, connecting, problem solving, reasoning, proving, reflecting. Um, and there's opportunities in every one of these to invite that deeper critical thought. So what I ask my students to do is I was doing a, the, a unit in grade 8 on uh, basically it's circles uh, and, and measuring cylinders and irregular shapes. And I didn't teach them anything about cylinders. This is what, what I normally did is I would teach them all of the elements of measuring cylinders, volume capacity, you know, we'd learn about circles first. And then we would do like the complex challenge. But what I noticed is that I lost students along the way. Like they couldn't find the meaning. Like why are we learning this? And so I decided to give them this challenge on the very first day. So the students had, I said to them, okay, I talked about the Guggenheim. I personally love the Guggenheim, so I got really excited. And you know, some of them have been to New York. I said, this is like an incredible architectural building. How would, could we determine a reasonable estimate for the surface area of this building? And then the students started to uncover what they needed to know. They're like, well, like, how are you gonna, how are you gonna measure like this, like a circular object? And <clears throat> how will you do that? And, and there was a hook now. And there was an engaging task so that as we learned about volume and surface area measurements of a cylinder, they had a reason for it. And it was very, very exciting. And I had students who were not always engaged in mathematics suddenly like talking to each other and so like trying to figure this out. And, and, and there's not a Googleable answer. There's not an answer to this question. Um, so that's the beauty of it. Like, they, they, like I said to them, you can't find this, and they come back to me like, I was looking and I went online, I couldn't find it. All I could find was the height, and now I've got to use the height to find find this. And and my unit cascaded out of this challenge. My entire unit, the curriculum expectations, cascaded out, and we now had a very meaningful task to to work around. And I was so excited. I really was enjoying that and what was going on in the classroom and students begging, like, how do you find the surface area of a cylinder? And do we expect grade eights to be saying that to us? <laughs> you know, we're not always expecting that. Um, so it's really, it's really wonderful for us as teachers when that happens. So I, I was thinking a lot about how do I teach them these tools? to enter into that challenge. So what knowledge, what mathematical knowledge do they need to solve this problem? And I started to choreograph their learning with this challenge by explicitly teaching these tools, right? We, we, the criteria of reasonableness, we had to unpack that. What is reasonable mathematically in this case and in terms of shape and dimension and proportion? So some rich mathematics surfacing from that, um, you know, the, the strategies they were going to use to solve it, like there was many different ways to try to enter into that problem, which one was going to be the most effective, the kinds of habits of mind, like, you know, my some of them were like, I, but there's not an answer for this, and like, well, there is, but what, what we're looking at is reasonable and helping them, um, you know, take some risks and be comfortable and tolerant of ambiguity, which I don't always think we have been great at in mathematics. And some people even say, I love math because there's a right answer. And while there's truth to the fact that there's, there are mathematical truths, like 2 plus 2 is 4, but there are so many creative um, realities and unknown answers in mathematics too. And bringing that and balancing the program with a question like this can really help to bring that dimension of math forward. And again, that's the mathematics that a lot of mathematicians are engaged with, not the simple, you know, two times two is four, but trying to solve a very complex proof. So, and this is, a, you know, a student and her thought book, and I, I do have permission um, 
just so people know from parents to use this image. But they, I gave them a thought book. And so you can see she's sketching and she's thinking and she's estimating and she's trying to figure this out. Uh, and it was so exciting. Like in their, they used their thought books as we learned more and more. They would revisit their estimates and change them and realize, okay, no, nope, that strategy was not effective. And the, con the concept attainment became deeper through this process because it wasn't just, okay, let's learn this and now we'll have a quiz on it. They were working with this idea, with these concepts for a course of, you know, five to six weeks. They were working on this problem. So again, deeper and slower. Um, and, and they'd say to me, I really, like, they would say, I really am enjoying this. And is my answer, you know, I think it's reasonable. Um, and another time I asked students, I used the prompt of designing a useful and creative structure incorporating cylinders. So that was a different cascading challenge instead of the reasonable estimate. And that's just an example. One of my students surprised me. Like, he came to school with this cement <laughs> stool that he, he made himself at home and had all of the measurements um, done for that. So that was, that was exciting, really exciting. And again, these are some of the notes from a student. And this is grade eight. And you know, it really is possible um, that our students amaze us and can do beautiful, rich mathematics. Yes, Lisa, I agree with you. That it, in reality, math does not generate tidy solutions. Um, and yet we, we kind of structured as a subject where it does. And, and, and I think it's that anxiety. Um, and not being able to grapple and sit with a question um, that hasn't been very beneficial for students in certain ways. And that was a fi another final product of, of designing this structure using cylinders and diverse 3D shapes. Another one in grade seven, I was inspired by Dan Meyer. Um, and so this was my unit launch as I showed the video, and it just shows about 30 seconds of this octagonal prism being filled. <clears throat> this is a grade 10 problem, but I modified it, and my grade 7s were able to do it. Um, it was fabulous. So this was the first day, and I said, okay, together, we're going to figure out how long it will take to fill this water tank. And again, all of the mathematics of that unit tumbled out of this problem. Students had their thought books, and they had to grapple with this challenge. And I did have a student who had come to me at the beginning of the year and said, you know, I, I just want you to know, because um, I also taught this student English, I really like English, but I'm just not a math person, he said to me. And I just don't want you to take it personally. <laughs> and during this unit, he came to me one day, I came into school, and he said, I hope you're going to teach us about conversions today, because I really need to understand that in order to solve this problem. And I was up last night. My parents made me go to bed because I was trying to figure this out. And like those are those priceless moments in teaching, right? Where, where you know, again, a student who hasn't liked math, and some of you mentioned that in your memorable moments. Like we can, that kind of an experience can just keep us going for a long time um, when we see a student lit up like that. And here's another page from a student's thought book grappling with this, this challenge. Um, when I introduce the thought books, I do show them, um, like these are the notes for Harry Potter. This is J.K. Rowling's storyboard. To help them understand that, you know, great products are the result of, of deep thinking and revisions and changing one's mind. And they started to really take their thought book, like the pride that they had in it. Um, you know, it was really wonderful to witness. You know, they were working away at it, and and we would joke like, you know, this might be in a museum someday, your, your thought book, and people will be studying it for your, your great insights. Um, yeah, and this is just a page from a, you know, mathematician's thought book. Obviously very complex math, not the math that we're doing, but even showing this to students. and and uh, giving them that sense of, you know, 
what thinking can look like, making it visible. A student who really understands can do these things. And again, when we're thinking about what a mathematician does with math, they can do these things. So it's the difference between, you know, a student who can recall a math fact, and it has its place, but a student who is able to think mathematically and understands the mathematics, this is what they can do. And so we want to provide the opportunities where they are able to show us their ability to do these things. And we want to provide them with opportunities where they're learning with a depth that allows them to grasp a concept deeply. And when we are looking for um, assessment of student thinking, as I mentioned, the, the second webinar in April, I will be focusing more on assessing uh, student thinking in mathematics. But we can use the lens of the tools, the intellectual tools, as the frame for the assessment. And it is powerful. It moves us right out of um, you know, the percentages and 8 out of 10. and you know, that gives us some information, but when we're asking these questions uh, through our observations, in our conversations, in the solutions, in the answers students give, we can make some very powerful um, interventions where we create an assessment-rich classroom where we're framing our feedback in the context of these tools. And just some, just some final um, additional ways to um, bump up the, the, the thinking. There are just some, some additional prompts. And that this, this slides will be posted. I will post a PDF because um, I know that some of these might be helpful for people to have. Just to summarize uh, some of the key ideas, critical thinking emphasizes the idea that math requires thinking for yourself, that we can help students develop metacognitive and self-regulation skills that support learning. And we have more options for adapting instruction to meet the needs of students. And I really, again, find that, that the frame of the tools has been a very powerful um, shift in my own classroom and has allowed me, I think, to be more effective in intervening at the appropriate time with the appropriate support because I've started to understand this student has a gap in the background knowledge and so I can target some, some things for this student in this way or I'm noticing the habit of mind of this student is preventing um, them from entering into a challenge. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jean. I, I have to say that one of the things um, I struggled in, you know, math, I, 
you know, I was a good math student, but I didn't find math meaningful. And one of the things I really com have committed to over the years is I didn't want to be the teacher that turned kids off of math. <laughs> That's been one of my main motivators as a teacher. Um, we do have some great, if you are part of a partner board and, and on our website, um, we do have list of partners. You may know that your board is already a partner, but you have access. There are a series of beautiful lessons that scaffold some of the intellectual tools, including some of the mathematics uh, tools that you can use, like how to, how to be reflective in mathematics. Um, and there will be a link provided there. There's also a hard copy that's available um, at a cost that perhaps your school or um, school board wanted to purchase, but all of those tools that are in the hard copy are available free online if you are, um, a, if your school board's a partner. And it just means logging in with your board email address, with your employee email address. If you're not a partner, um, just paying a $40 fee um, to become an individual member gives you access to just a a, just a stunning array of, of resources that are that are on our site, and there's lots that are there free, even if you are not a member. Um, Lisa, my April seminar, I believe, is called Assessing Mathematical Thinking, and I've got some recommended references that'll be posted online um, after the fact. Um, and I know we have five minutes left, and I want to respect people's time because I'm sure it's been a long day. But if there's any additional questions right now or any comments uh, that people have, please feel free at this point. Some of the open-ended questions come from the Lainey Schuster and Nancy uh, Caravan book. And then I usually use the critical thinking prompts to consolidate the learning. And I love Jo Bowler's website, Ucubed, and she's got an excellent course, How to Teach Math, that's available through Stanford for $100, and you can do it at your own pace. And I've, I've really um, enjoyed that, and I highly recommend it as well. I love a lot of the work that she's doing in math, and she's got beautiful little videos that are student-friendly around some of the things we've been talking about um, that really set the stage for a culture in your classroom around growth mindset and embracing mistakes. So um, I want to thank everyone for participating tonight. Um, it's been a real pleasure. I just I love working with the uh, fellow passionate educators and I wish you all well and perhaps I'll see some of you in the in the April webinar. So have a great evening. Thanks Leah for that uh, incredible um, presentation. I love I second um, that I forget who said it Lisa's comment that I would have loved to be in your math class because math um, should be fun and you certainly made that and I love your comment about math being messy and all of this critical thinking being messy. That was excellent. Um, I just want to remind people that we have a, a survey that we would um, really encourage you to fill out if you could. Um, it's a t sort of a twofold re um, reason. One of them is that it will provide feedback for Maria for her fabulous session. And also provide some feedback to, um, oops, that's the wrong link. Some feedback to um, OTF that will um, that enable them to um, provide some more sessions. There's two ways to access this the webinar, uh, the the survey. One of them is right when you log out of the Blackboard session, it will take you directly to the the um, the survey. And once you fill it out, it will um, prompt you to download a certificate of participation that some people like for their um, professional port portfolios. We also, as Maria mentioned, there were also some, um, there's the link in the chat for the feedback um, survey. Uh, Maria also mentioned that there are more um, webinars coming up. Um, there's just one more before the March break, and I hope that you all have a very well-deserved rest during the next 
um, the next week. Um, and OTF Connects will come back after the March break with some um, great sessions, including another one by Maria. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us tonight, and we hope to see you again.